Welcome. Uh, very good morning to you. Uh, and this is the uh, webinar on asserting livelihoods with dignity, a specific focus on urban livelihoods. Very nice to see everyone. Many of you are old friends, and uh, it's good that we're all here together again. Uh, today's webinar is part of a series called Reimagining the Future, uh, a people's agenda for a post-COVID economy. Uh, and this series is part of a much larger process to really initiate debates on what are the alternatives, what are the alternate economic options we have post this COVID situation that we're in while also addressing the immediate needs. And I think this is both visionary, but also with its feet on the ground to really look ahead and see how can we use this time to really reimagine our future. So it's a very uh, exciting space, I think. And the conversations have been going on for several weeks now, very insightful, deep, and also rooted. Uh, this process is a collective effort of several civil society organizations, people's movements, trade unions, networks across the country. Um, and the organization I'm with, Yuva, is a part of this collective. We're very proud and happy to be a part of this collective. And we are supporting the collective and coordinating the webinar today on the urban livelihood piece. Um, before we begin, I want to just give you a few you know, housekeeping instructions on Zoom. Please keep your microphones mute at all times. Only the speakers and the panelists will have their microphones on. And any questions or comments, we request that you send it in the Zoom chat box in the comment section. Or else in the Facebook Live, you can also send it in the comment section. So however you're connecting with us, please use the chat box in the comment section to share your inputs. Uh, we are very happy to share that the Hindi translation is available for all the participants. To listen to that, however, you have to click the French button and mute the original audio in the language interpretation option in Zoom. If you can click the language interpretation and then click mute original audio and then click French because unfortunately Zoom only has an option for French. Uh, all the registered participants have a detailed guideline on this so you could refer back if you would want the Hindi translation. And a colleague will also post the instructions in the chat box in case you have missed the email. Um, also, there is a request for all the speakers and the moderator to speak slowly as the translation into Hindi is happening simultaneously as we are speaking. Uh, so these are the housekeeping, I think, that we just wanted to share. If anything, you can also post questions in the chat box and we will try to support you. Uh, so I, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, uh, Katie Suresh, for the day. Katie is, uh, I think many of you know him, Katie Suresh or Katie, as he's known to most of us for the last 30 years has worked in a variety of organizations, particularly looking at leadership and to really initiate and sustain change processes within organizations. That's been the core, I think, of his work. Uh, some of the organizations, Katie has been part of her action aid and where he's currently based leading the national work on labor and especially the urban space. He was also the previous executive director of the Yuva Collective here in Mumbai, uh, also the national director of Amnesty International India, as well as he worked with equations. Uh, currently, Katie's work is focused very specifically on rights and sustainable livelihoods through collective action and education for people dependent on the informal economy in India. So I think his input will be very, very uh, insightful for the conversation today. He is also the course director of uh, the Urban Action School, which many of you may have heard of, uh, which is housed in the Citizens Rights Collective, a collective of Action Aid since 2015. And this has been a very, very sharp platform for synthesizing knowledge and debates and really encouraging uh, young people and practitioners to input into the uh, uh, informal economy in a very sharp and critical way. Uh, the UAS is a school for mid to senior level urban practitioners related to issues on urbanization in cities. Uh, and as the urban policy hub of India, CIRIX focuses on urban issues as well. And all of his work and Cirix works is really rooted in the framework of rights, gender equality and social justice. So uh, welcome, Katie. Very, very nice to have you. And, uh, and, and uh, we're really, really privileged that you are leading this uh, and moderating the webinar today. We also have a very um, a wonderful panel, but I will hand it over to you, Katie, and please do introduce uh, the panel and carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roshni. Um, this uh, meeting, as is, uh, as Roshni has introduced us, is, uh, is organized to, to understand the larger dimensions of urban 
livelihoods and to contextualize it within urban poverty and the uh, issues that we have also been uh, uh, recently um, you know, hit with in terms of the um, opening up of the process because of the fact that COVID and the pandemic situation has uh, unmasked a whole bunch of things. Um, what I'm going to do now is, uh, is also to introduce uh, the uh, panel of speakers uh, and not take too much time away from their, uh, uh, their introducing the topic because that, uh, what we, uh, what we in, are planning to do is to have each one of us uh, panel of speakers uh, uh, about 15, 20 minutes of time uh, to introduce it, introduce the discussion on uh, urban livelihoods in ways in which each one will bring a certain vantage point into the discussion. Um, we have uh, three eminent speakers. We have uh, Professor Ritu Divan. We have Anita Das from the National Women Hawkers Federation and Mr. S.M. Vijayanand. I will introduce them formally uh, and properly in terms of uh, their bios. Uh, but what I want to set out in this uh, for all of us is that we would, what we do is to hear one round of opening comments from each one of our speakers for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we, uh, we will then, uh, I will introduce a few more questions that I think would be useful to look at from the point of view of, uh, of the larger debate. We have a good period of time, uh, Center for uh, Financial Accountability and UBA have have organized this for a couple of hours. So I think we would be able to take uh, another round of, uh, of interventions from the speakers. And uh, we would certainly then welcome uh, your questions, your interjections and your comments, which uh, we will try and feed back into the, uh, into the discussion so that uh, we can get another round of, uh, you know, thoughts and uh, maybe a final set of concluding comments from our speakers. Uh, so this is the way I thought that would be the best way to utilize the time that we have. Um, if this is all right with all of us, then maybe let me uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Ritu Diwan, the first woman director of the Department of Economics, University of Mumbai, and the founder member of the first Center for Gender Economics in Asia. She is also the Vice President of the Indian Society for Labor Economics, Visiting Professor at the, Indian of, at the Institute of Human Development, Executive Editor of Leaflet.in, Trustee of the India Forum, and the President of the Indian Association of Women's Studies between 2014 and 2017. She has over 150 publications, including 40 books, monographs, encompassing a wide range of issues, including development economics, gender studies, gender economics, rural and urban development, infrastructure, labor markets, environmental displacement, peace studies, etc. Professor Divan was a member of the Feminist econo Economist uh, Group for Engendering the 12th and the 11th five-year plans, as well as the subgroup on gender and macroeconomics appointed by the Planning Commission. Government of India. She has also been a consultant with UNDP, UN Women, ILO, World Wildlife Fund, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, uh, Kashmir Foundation for Peace and Development, Action Aid, etc. Her other honorary posts include National Executive Member of the Pakistan India Forum for Peace and Democracy. Honorary Advisor to the Kashmir Foundation for Peace and Development Studies, and the Board of Trustees of the Center for Budget Governance and Accountability. She's closely associated with the training and capacity building related, uh, especially to gender budgeting and gender issues, and has conducted numerous workshops for central government and also several state governments, including Jammu Kashmir, Maharashtra, Goa, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, etc. Her research focus is generally the result of uh, issues related to the marginalized, and the last two focusing on theoretical empirical analysis of paid and unpaid work and demonetization. 
both of which pieces of work I'm very familiar with. And I'm so glad that she is the person who's going to lead us onto this conversation on understanding uh, urban livelihoods in a broader conceptual uh, framework before we bring in the other two eminent speakers. Uh, so may I invite uh, Professor Ritu Diwan? Well, of course, I'd uh, like to thank you all for organizing this series of uh, uh, discussions because uh, they have been, of course, we know like 10 webinars a day. But uh, I think this is one of the few series which take a militaristic perspective in terms of what really do we do now in the future. So for me, that's something which is very, very important, uh, very essential. And of course, to be seen within a context of something which is already existing at a macro level, and of course, at various uh, other kinds of things. So, thank you uh, very much for uh, this uh, organizing this entire uh, series. Now, I, I just want to divide my uh, presentation in two parts. One is the fact that the fault lines which have existed already in the last several years and uh, which are now exposed or now visualized very much so, but uh, also deepened in many, many kinds of ways. And at the second level, in terms of whatever my experience has been in terms of researching in the last two or three months, and actually the working with migrant workers in urban areas, certain kinds of suggestions can be taken forward at uh, a broader level and also at a very local level, keeping the regional uh, differences in mind. So what I really uh, uh, want to focus on, like I was saying, two aspects. One, at the broader macro level, what the situation has been, and uh, therefore, in relation to what the existing situation was before the pandemic, I mean, everything now is before and uh, after, is uh, what I have understood from my involvement in uh, relief work among the migrants, urban migrants in particular, and the impact of library. So then a series of suggestions, which maybe which we can uh, take forward at the uh, later stage or even already now, because we are talking of an opening up of the economy and the seizure of uh, what is called the lockdown, which I, I think have to call the lockup. It's really not a uh, lockdown. Now, uh, there were certain uh, factors which uh, existed earlier and existed earlier over a period of time, over maybe a decade or maybe more than a decade, but very much so in the last four or five years. And uh, starting off with the most important aspect that the economy, of course, has been collapsing at the macro level. This is something we've been debating for a long period of time. But what really shocked everybody is the GDP data which has been released just last week which shows that the economy is the lowest level of growth up to March 31st, which is before the uh, lockup was uh, announced. And uh, therefore, what, what we discuss and what the future is depends and focuses on the basis of this utter state of uh, collapse. There are, now this collapse, of course, has been seen mostly in uh, urban areas the, uh, and the collapse in manufacturing. So this is something which affects urban livelihoods at a very, you know, very fundamental level. Other aspects which are uh, to be linked in and which are extremely important, the actual decline for the first time in the history of India is a decline in the actual money wages. Relative wages, of course, have been declining. But to have wages declining in absolute terms, in terms of money, Keeping the, um, the issue of uh, consumer price index and all aside is something which is very, very, very shocking. And again, the decline is much more in the urban areas than in the rural areas. An actual increase in 40 years, it never happened that the percentage of people below the poverty line is actually increased by 5%. And this, again, this increase in uh, the below poverty line, whatever the poverty line may be defined as, has taken place much more in urban areas than it has in uh, rural areas. The fourth aspect is, I think, which is a major concern internationally, not only nationally, is a massive decline in the female workforce, particularly, again, in urban areas. 
and this does not link up to the fact that you, that you know people women are studying and therefore they don't work etc etc it is much more fundamental and it is much more structural and speaks very clearly of the entire link between the patriarchal structures and the pattern of growth and that is something we need to really very seriously take into account there are several other aspects that again for the first time a massive increase in inequality which the Oxfam report has brought out so well, uh, I think a few months ago. The fall in the share of wages to the total cost of production in spite of the fact that there has been a decline in not only in absolute wages, not only in relative wages, but also in the issue of employment. So these are certain structural factors, macro factors which we have to factor which we have to take into account. Combined with this, what you are all familiar with, is the initiation of what is called the labor code. We already have labor code 1, 2, 3, and of course 4 is under um, debate. And what the labor code does is it takes away the, uh, not going into any great details, but it takes away the rights of domestic workers, which are largely women, urban women again, to be even recognized as workers. Now, if you're not recognized as workers, this includes BD workers and a whole lot of other sections where you're going to be totally out of any kind of benefit of labor decision. What it also does is it increases the work hours, it redefines the concept of the workplace, it separates, in any case, women's workforce, particularly in urban areas, are not seen as uh, economic agents, they're seen as reproductive agents. But even within this, what has been done, and that is something which is, I mean, there's an international outcry against it. Organizationally, and politically, in terms of movement, etc., is that the right to safety at workplace now does not include sexual harassment. This is something which is, is, is just totally non-acceptable and non-negotiable. So that is something which adds on to our struggle for better uh, urban livelihood and an improvement. There are, of course, other issues, the privatization of insurance, increasing informalization and gig economy, the passing of the trafficking act, anti-trafficking act, which a lot of us have opposed and uh, we did not succeed, which what it does, it equates trafficking with rural migration in terms of urban employment particularly where women are uh, concerned. Of course, the policy of smart cities, which has been talked about and some amount of money not implemented is a different type of anything. But the concept of a smart city, which has absolutely no place and no space either in policy or in the city for the working class and for the workers. They are uh, Several changes, I'm not going to the details of the relief package that is a, is a totally separate kind of a discussion which maybe we can have at a later stage. But under the cover of COVID, there are three or four very, very fundamental issues which have been done. One is the issue of self-reliance. I mean, we know the term Asman in Bhattam. But the utter contradiction that you have the concept of self-reliance talked about in the context of increasing foreign investment. So really the two just cut across each other and negate each other theoretically, empirically, in terms of policy, in terms of investment, in, in every single kind of uh, way which was we talk about. The second is the issue of massive privatization which has uh, taken place along with the sale of public sector. So again, redefining self-reliance by taking out the entire basis of what is self-reliance is something which needs to be debated in the broader context of what is going to happen to employment, particularly in uh, urban areas. I'm not even going into the issue of labor reform, which we are already clear about, what uh, three or four state governments have put in, the 12-hour workday, the denial of creches, the denial of toilets, the denial of minimum wages, the denial of uh, of uh, overtime wages, not even water and a lunch break, which is being thought about and cleared by at least these state uh, governments. Now, the suggestions which I will put forward, of course, like I said, is a result of my academic work and the activism which I have been 
involved them for a very long time, particularly in the last three or four months, is that the rural urban interlinkages, I think, is something we need to focus on even more. The one of the major impacts of what I found in my demonetization study is a huge reverse migration and the burden of uh, the employment, of supporting people, of sustenance, etc., which is now much more on the rural economy than it is on the urban economy. And this actually has been strengthened by the process of, it, it's not so much the pandemic itself, but the way the pandemic has been dealt with in policy initiatives or lack of initiatives. I think that we need to really separate uh, these things. Of course, we talk about an urban employment program, but if that is even agreed or thought of or put into space, I think the first thing we need to focus on is where does the problem of the economy lie? Historically, in the past uh, few years, and very much so even now, and this is something not what only some economists are saying, but I think there's everybody whose work of being called an uh, economist talking about, including uh, manufacturers, you know, heads of PTE and CII, forget about trade union leaders, who will also support to this, is that the fundamental problem lies with the total mismatch that the economy cannot recover. It could not recover in the last few years and it cannot recover now in the post-pandemic uh, uh, situation, actually during the pandemic situation, unless there is more money in people's hands. That is, the issue of demand becomes much, much more important than the issue of supply. That supply of goods cannot take place unless people have money in their hands, and therefore something which we really need to fight for, particularly in urban, of course in rural areas, but very much so in urban areas, keeping in context increasing urbanization, is the issue of a basic minimum uh, income or an unemployment allowance. I think that is something we need to really focus on, not only in terms of those who are employed, but even those who are self-employed. And therefore, something which I've been pushing for, but of course, uh, Niti Ayoga, whoever it is, just do not accept these uh, suggestions, is to have sub uh, subsidized supply chains, particularly for SSI, that is a small sector unit, and for SSEs, and of course for the small uh, micro industries, is to have free supply of raw materials, if not very really heavily subsidized raw materials. Because the major form of employment in urban areas is self-employment, and that is something which we need to factor whatever policies we want to suggest for the future that we want to see. The, there are two or three other suggestions which uh, I would like to make, and something which I've been struggling with the Maharashtra government for a long, long period of time. But of course, these things are not accepted. And that is forming workers cooperatives for different things. We used to have this uh, employment exchanges which have now totally died down or it's converted into online which the majority of people cannot really access. So maybe that is one sector or one form of uh, urban livelihoods that we could look at that we initiate workers cooperatives for different ways and link up with whether it's industries, whether it's exercise or larger uh, uh, manufacturing units or even residence associations and housing societies and try and develop that. Uh, two, there are several more and uh, I'd just like to focus on them. One, of course, now we talk about one, uh, uh, one Russian card, one family, one Russian card. But the problem is that if a large amount of migration, I think about 90% of migration or 85% of urban, rural to urban migration is of single men. And if it is for single men, we know that the Russian card is left behind for the family, whether it is parents or wife or whoever it is. So it's not a question of one Russian card for family, but two where migrants are concerned. So you have a Russian card when you're single and you have a Russian card which is there with your family back home. And this also applies to what I call double school enrollment for families which migrate. That there should be a fluid enrollment for in schools in particular and ICDS and Mediterranean where children of migrants are uh, concerned. Uh, another issue which I've been uh, struggling for and which I think may be something which we can take up is that 
both species in slum areas. Now, a large amount of self-employment, own account workers, etc., function within the um, uh, within the slum areas in uh, in urban uh, cities in uh, particular, and that the government, state government in particular, and the board. I think we also need to go to the panchayat level and the worldwide kind of planning and uh, the intervention which we can take place is that spaces should be allocated within the slum. There is enough land. There is absolutely no problem. There is enough land even located within the slum, whether it's a closed BMC school or a primary health center which needs to function, which does not function. So you have the concept of a, um, a collective functioning of individual workers. So the context of work, the context of workers, the context of workplace, all then therefore get amalgamated into one uh, aspect. Now there are two more. I've got, of course, is the broader issue, which I'm not going to get into, which requires a, a separate uh, kind of a debate. And that is the fiscal architecture and the fiscal policy uh, initiatives, not only in the post-COVID uh, 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 time, beyond the relief packages, but even earlier. And this huge change in uh, fiscal policy with the finance commission, etc., where the share to the state has been reduced, and now several state governments have announced that development funding has been will be reduced by a minimum of two thirds. So what we are looking at is not only something which is immediate, but something which is going to have a long-term effect of maybe at least three or four years, and at least one generation which is going to be impacted. Now there is one uh, 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 initiative which we are trying to take up in uh, in Bombay, Mumbai, sorry, and that is that there are several spaces which have been allocated as relief camps. The effort now is to say that can some of these relief camps be converted into permanent housing for migrants? Okay. That is something which we are really trying to do, whether it is dormitory for uh, single uh, women or uh, single men. Kerala has set some excellent examples of how single women migrants can be looked after in terms of uh, accommodation. Now, this is something which we are trying to do, and we just hope that it is in one area. It will, be, uh, it will be useful for us. The last issue is uh, relating particularly, not only, but especially to women, and that is a huge increase in unpaid work which has taken place. That you can't access hospitals or primary health centers, one, because you can't afford them, secondly, because your health policy over the past few years has reduced the functioning and the investment, of course, in primary health centers or in public hospitals. And therefore, this entire burden falls on women within the family, including that of when families stay at home during the lockup and the kind of work which women do. And the, the issue of unpaid work is, is, you know, the paid economy cannot survive. The urban, rural, it cannot survive unless there is an unpaid economy which is shoring up and taking the responsibility of what the state should be doing. So this is something I feel very, very strongly about. These are some uh, suggestions which I have uh, put forward, and I hope we can take some in practice, some in theoretical discussion. But one uh, statement which has stuck with me for a, it, it just changed my entire thinking of why is, is the center or the state, are they irresponsible? They did not see the impact of what is going to happen on migrants that you give four days for, you know, lighting lamps and planning thalus, but four hours for a country of our size to close down. And when I was discussing with a worker with this, he just put it very, it, it just, you know, made me rethink everything. He said, hum bhi NRI hai. And I'm saying, excuse me, aap NRI hai? He says, hum non-required Indian hai. So even if we fall off the the map of physical existence, forget about labor force participation, it doesn't really matter. What it is going to do is solve the unemployment problem. This, I, I think, is, is something which uh, uh, really took up and made me rethink of that it is not just callousness or couldn't care or lack of compassion, etc. 
there is a, a deliberate policy to see that it doesn't matter what urban livelihoods are and who is at the scene. A lot more to say, but I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Divan. Uh, as uh, I anticipated, you covered uh, a huge swathe of uh, ground, uh, conceptually sort of uh, placing your, uh, placing the discourse, so to speak, for our webinar today. Um, you talked about the macroeconomic conditions and, uh, and I think it is deeply evocative that you were uh, able to bring us uh, to the context of the individual when you uh, pointed out to the non-required Indians. Uh, bringing that uh, narrative to us is very, very important. And this kind of uh, uh, helps us move very, very quickly to the next speaker. And I am not going to try to summarize what you said. That will be, uh, be a terrible thing on my part to do that. Uh, what, what I would uh, request for you also in your second round is to uh, to develop on a couple of these ideas, especially the solutions that you've talked about, because I, I think it's extremely important for us to discuss uh, in this group as well. Uh, I am now going to uh, request uh, uh, Anita Das uh, to, uh, to speak. She's the founder and the general secretary of the All India Hawkers Federation. She's also the additional general secretary of the National Hawkers Federation in Jharkhand where for 10 years she's been, she has worked to ensure the implementation of the Street Vendors Act. She's been instrumental in ensuring that markets are created for street vendors, where eviction of vendors have taken place. Uh, Ranchi, where she's uh, based, uh, remains one of the few cities where the Street Vendors Act has been implemented successfully. And um, I request, uh, Anita Das to, to, to take forward the discussion from where Professor Ritu Devan left, where she brought in the, uh, the narrative of the individual who's going through the understanding of what urban livelihoods is all about. And I think you're best equipped to handle that, that question. So Anita Ji, up, uh, over to you. Uh, namaste. Uh, I am All India Women Hawkers Federation ki General Secretary. Uh, actually, abhi jo, aaj jo mudde pe charcha ho rahe hain, wo sahi samay pe hi ye mudde jo hai, aaj sab ko aaj dhanyavad dete huye ham apna baat ko aage karenge. Ye jo hamare desh mein jo abhi chal rahe hain COVID-19 ki jo door chal rahe, jis tarika se hamare desh mein aaj भयंकर परिस्थिति है इस परिस्थिति में आज अगर माइग्रेन और मजदूरों की और जो मजदूर की संख्या को आज अगर देखा जाए तो ये जिस तरीके से संख्या आज एक आंकड़ा पता था कि ये इतने आंकड़े हो सकते इतने आंकड़े आज पूरा रास्ते पे जो आज उतर के आए हैं सरकार जिस तरीके से उदासीनता दिखाया है और पूरा हमारा मजदूर जिस तकलीफ से गुजर रहे हैं और उस तकलीफ से गुजारते हुए उन महिला मजदूर जिस तरीके से बच्चे को कंधे में डालते हुए रास्ते पे हजारों हजारों माइल पैदल चलते हुए कितने लोगों को जान चले गए हैं आज सरकार एकदम चुप बैठा हुआ है सबसे पहले ये लॉकडाउन करना था ये मजदूर को अपना घर भेज के फिर लॉकडाउन करना था लेकिन सरकार एकदम भी कोई काम नहीं किया है आज अगर देखा जाए कि ये जो सरकार से पहले जो सरकार थी और उस समय पे भी जो मजदूरों की हक की बात कहा गया था लेकिन असंगठित तो क्षेत्रों की मजदूरों की जो बात किया गया था उस समय में भी कुछ नहीं किया गया और आज भी नहीं आज इन मजदूरों के लिए एक ही आवाज एक साथ इन मजदूरों के लिए एक साथ आवाज उठाना है असंगठित क्षेत्रों की मजदूर में एक लाख करोड़ रुपया जिस समय पे जिस समय पे देना था उसी समय पे आज स्पेशल इकोनॉमिक जोन के लिए पांच करोड़ पांच लाख करोड़ रुपया उस समय पे मनमोहन सिंह ने छोड़ दिया था लेकिन इन मजदूरों के लिए अभी भी बोल रही हूँ कि कुछ नहीं किया गया है लेकिन अगर देखा जाए आज जिस तरीका से आज इस 
मजदूर का ट्रेन में भेजने की बात हुआ जिस तरीके से ट्रेन के अंदर में मजदूर मर रहे हैं जिस तरीके से पैदल चलते हुए ट्रेन में आ, मर गए हैं उनके बाहर में पैदल चलते चलते लोग मर गए हैं लेकिन फ्लाइट पे अमीरों के लिए व्यवस्था था और मजदूरों के लिए भी भेजने के लिए वो भी पैसा दिया गया मजदूरों को तो वो शोषण एक तरफ उन मजदूर का क्या जिन मजदूर लोगों का और अनरगन सेक्टर में जिन महिलाओं को जो तकलीफ के साथ और गुजरना पड़ रहा है आज बच्चों का मुंह में खाना नहीं है अखबार में पढ़ रहे थे इस तरीका से आज तीन हजार रुपये के लिए बेटी को बेचना पड़ा है आज बड़ा बड़ा अक्षर में लिखा जा रहा है बहुत भयंकर परिस्थिति है इस परिस्थिति को हम मुंह से बयान नहीं कर सकते हैं पूरा देश देखा पूरा देश देख रहा है और इस परिस्थिति को समझ रहा है कि क्या हालत होगा आने वाला दिन में बहुत भयंकर परिस्थिति और इस दौर पे जो कोविड नाइन्टीन की दौड़ में जो स्ट्रीट वेंडर जो मैं काम करती हूँ जिन हॉकर्स की बात कहा गया उस हॉकर सी एकमात्र रोड में बैठ के दुकानदारी करने की कोशिश किया आज एक तरफ कोई रास्ता नहीं बचा है जो लोकल था कुछ लोग जो बाहर से आके दुकानदारी करते हैं आज वो लोग नहीं आ पाया लॉकडाउन पे वो लोगों का गाड़ी नहीं चला ट्रेन नहीं चला वो लोग नहीं आ पाया जो लोकल लोग था कुछ हद तक लोग रोड में बैठ के दुकानदारी करे बट उस हालात में वो उसका संख्या बहुत कम लेकिन जो लोकल उनके साथ जुड़ गया है जो स्ट्रीट वेंडर्स है जिनका जो मजदूरी करते थे उनके पास काम नहीं है लोकल जो रहने वाले थे वो लोग आज आ गए हैं आज वो लोग और कुछ लोकल लोग मिल के जिस तरीका से वो भी हम लोग बार बार सरकार से एक ही बात कहा है कि पूरा दुकान को स्ट्रीट वेंडर्स को खोलना चाहिए लेकिन उस समय में मात्र हम लोग अर्बन मिनिस्टर को लेकर लेटर लिखा उस समय पे भी उन्होंने कहा कि नहीं मात्र तीन सामान के लिए छूट दिया गया था ग्रोसरी सामान स्ट्रीट वेंडर सब्जी और फल और ग्रोसरी का सामान लेकिन उसमें भी कितना परसेंटेज है वो परसेंटेज बहुत ही कम है लेकिन उसमें भी जो हॉकर दुकानदारी करा और जो नया हॉकर जुड़ा आज आने वाला दिन में ये बहुत बड़ा लड़ाई होगी पुराने हॉकर और नए हॉकर आज संगठन को उस हॉकर के लिए लड़ना पड़ेगा जो आज जो हमारे देश में हॉकरी कर रहे हैं हमारी अर्थव्यवस्था को मजबूत कर रहे हैं एकमात्र जिस समय पे जिस समय पे अर्थव्यवस्था दो में और नौ में अर्थव्यवस्था हो गया था यही हॉकर्स की जो बिक्री था उनके लिए किसान जो छोटा छोटा युद्धकारी था जो सामान तैयार कर रहे थे और उनका सामान ही को आके ये हॉकर लोग बेच रहे थे वो इकोनॉमिक को मजबूत किया था आज हम यूनियन वाले को उस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को जो हॉकर्स के लिए हम लोग मिलके काम कर रहे हैं सबको इकट्ठा होके जो नए हॉकर बन रहे हैं उनके साथ भी उनको लेके आज हम लोग आगे बढ़ेंगे और उनको भी राइट्स और अधिकार देना पड़ेगा 2014 में जो स्ट्रीट वेंडर्स के लिए कानून बना था आज सरकार बोल रहे हैं दस हजार की लोन देने की लेकिन आज हम लोगों ने एक ही नेशनल हॉकर्स फेडरेशन ने एक ही बात एक ही मुद्दा एक ही आवाज उठाया था कि आज पांच तीन से पांच हजार रुपया छह महीना तक इन इन लोगों की खाते में पैसा जाना चाहिए लेकिन आज सरकार ने ये बात को भी नकारा पूरा ऑल इंडिया की राज्य सरकार को भी लेटर लिखा गया अर्बन मिनिस्टर को भी लेकर लेटर लिखा गया लेकिन अर्बन सेक्रेटरी के साथ लगातार चर्चा चला लेकिन उन्होंने एक ही बात कहा है लोन के लिए व्यवस्था कर रहे हैं हम लोग लेकिन हम लोगों ने ये बात भी कहा था कि सब्सिडी देने की बात लेकिन सरकार ने नहीं माना दो के कानून के बाद तो ऑलरेडी फुटपाथ दुकानदारों के लिए स्ट्रीट वेंडर्स के लिए लोन अलॉटमेंट था लेकिन आज नया क्या दिया सरकार ने कुछ नहीं फिर और एक बार ऋण का बोझा उनके सर पे उतार दे रहे हैं हम लोग बार बार ये बात भी कह रहे हैं आज अर्थव्यवस्था कौन मजबूत करेगा यही हॉकर्स लेकिन आज उनको लोन की बारे में बात किया दस हजार रुपया में कुछ नहीं होने वाला है आज पूरा देश की अगर सर्वे की बात कहा जाए वो भी कम संख्या दिखाया है अठारह लाख से पचास लाख के अंदर दिखाया ऑफिशियली अठारह लाख फिर हम लोग जब लड़ाई के चार करोड़ हॉकर से पूरा देश में उसमें भी पचास लाख हॉकर्स की बात कहा है 
तो साथ ही ये बहुत भयंकर परिस्थिति है आज उन लोगों के लिए लड़ना पड़ेगा जो लोग नया होकर से और उन महिला जिन महिलाओं का आज हालात आज आज नॉर्थ ईस्ट की महिलाओं की है जो लॉकडाउन के पीरियड में उनका सामान जो बिक्री करता है महिला हॉकर्स वो सामान उनके पास नहीं पहुंच रहा है एक भयंकर परिस्थिति है क्योंकि जो पहाड़ी इलाका में महिला लोग हैं पूरा हमारे नॉर्थ ईस्ट अरुणाचल मणिपुर वहां लॉकडाउन के कारण जो सामान बड़े बड़े शहरों से जाता था गुवाहाटी से जाता था जो कोलकाता से जाता था दिल्ली बॉम्बे से जो सामान जाते थे आज सारा सामान जाना बंद है बहुत परिस्थिति खराब चल रहा है लेकिन उसमें भी उन लोगों के लिए भी कुछ राहत नहीं है दस हजार के लोन से क्या होगा सरकार इस बात को एकदम इग्नोर करा है क्योंकि सरकार हमेशा पूंजीपति का साथ दिया है और गरीबों के लिए कुछ नहीं इसीलिए आज हॉकर्स को लेके उनके लिए एक डिमांड और रखा था कि पैसा छपाना होगा इन मजदूरों के लिए इन मजदूरों के लिए पैसा छपा के उनके पास देना होगा और उन्ही पैसा से शहर का अर्थव्यवस्था और शहर का मौजूद रहेगा अर्थव्यवस्था लेकिन वो भी नहीं किया एक साथ ये तमाम मजदूर कुछ कुछ मजदूर ऐसे भी हैं जो रजिस्टर्ड नहीं है जो मजदूर ऐसे भी है सुबह से लेकर शाम तक रोड में खड़ा होता था काम करने के लिए आज उनके पास काम नहीं है उनके पास काम छीना गया है लॉकडाउन के कारण आज उनकी परिस्थिति जो रजिस्टर मजदूर नहीं है आज उनका क्या होगा जो सौ दिन की काम रूरल में था आज वो शहर में आना लाना पड़ेगा जो 100 दिन की काम थी आज वो शहर में अरबन में लाना पड़ेगा हर सेक्टर में ये काम होना चाहिए जो पढ़े लिखे लोग भी है आज गांव में लाइन लगा रहे हैं काम के लिए जो जो होकर बाहर से आ चुके जो मजदूर बाहर से आ चुके हैं आज वो काम की जरूरत है उनको वो कहा पे जाएगा वो वापस आधे से आधे ज्यादा लोग ही चलेगा ये लंबा दौर चलेगा कोविड नाइन्टीन में लेकिन ये लंबा दौर चलने के कारण जो डोमेस्टिक वर्कर है महिलाओं की क्या हालत है उनको घर में घुसने नहीं दे रहे हैं आज उनकी जो मजदूरी है वो नहीं दिया जा रहा है सबको बोल दिया काम पे मत आई आज उन महिलाओं का क्या क्या हालत होगा आज ये परिस्थिति के कारण उन महिलाओं को आज दूसरा कुछ काम करने के लिए मजबूर करना पड़ रहा है आज ये परिस्थिति में सरकार एकदम उदासीनता दिखाया कुछ नहीं किया है आज एमएलए एमपी काउंसिलर कोविड 19 में सबका मुखौटा बाहर आ गया है आज इन लोगों के पास में खड़े होने के लिए कोई नहीं एक ही रास्ता है जो 100 दिन का काम रूरल में है आज वो शहर में भी डाला पड़ेगा ये हॉकर्स की जो नए हॉकर्स बढ़ रहे हैं उन हॉकर्स की लेके यूनियन को एक साथ मिलके उन लोगों को नया से जुड़ के पुराना और हॉकर्स बहुत लड़ाई होगा लेकिन उसको एक साथ मिलकर उनको रजिस्ट्रेशन सर्वे सारा चीज को पुख्ता करना पड़ेगा 2014 में कानून के साथ उन नए हॉकर्स को जोड़ना पड़ेगा और बहुत बड़ा लड़ाई आंदोलन छेड़ना पड़ेगा अभी असंगठित क्षेत्र की मजदूर में एक साथ होके तमाम सेक्टर के लोग एक साथ होके आज आज वो समय आया है जो एक साथ जमीन में उतर के हम लोगों को ये आवाज उठाना पड़ेगा साथ ही मैं बहुत बड़ा नहीं बोल रही हूँ क्योंकि आज की परिस्थिति आज की अर्थव्यवस्था आज जो समस्या ये लंबा ये 2020 साल जो है बहुत भयंकर रूप से हमारे सामने आ रहे हैं उसमें भी वेस्ट बंगाल में आमफान महाराष्ट्र में भी तूफान आया इसमें जो जो हमारी वेजिटेबल जो हमारे प्राकृतिक आपदा आ रहे हैं उसमें भी कुछ नहीं हो पा रहे हैं आज मजदूर के संख्या आज नेशनल हॉकॉस फेडरेशन लगातार आज 70 डेज हो गए हैं लगातार सबके पास पहुंचने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं मजदूरों के पास पहुंचने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं लेकिन ऐसे करके कब तक चलेगा समस्त लोगों को एक साथ आना पड़ेगा आज वही है कि हमारे जो है सरकार कुछ काम नहीं करा हम लोगों को मिलके इसको आगे बढ़ाना है हमारी हक और अधिकार की लड़ाई एक साथ मिल लड़ना है धन्यवाद सर धन्यवाद अनिता जी अनिता जी आ, मैं मैं चाह रहा वो काफी सारे मुद्दों पे बात आपने की लेकिन दो जो तस्वीर जो मेरे सामने उभर के आ रहा था मैं सोच रहा था कि आपसे अभी पूछ लू इसके बारे में एक तो जो तस्वीर हमारे मतलब सबके सामने जो आ रहा था वो ये था कि लॉकडाउन के के वक्त पे बहुत सारे हॉकर्स के ऊपर बहुत सारा अत्याचार हो रहा था वीडियोज भी आ रहे थे सोशल मीडिया में 
जो पुलिस की जो रवैया है उसके बारे में तो मैं सोच रहा था कि अगर आप उस पर कुछ बात रखें तो हमारे जो साथी हैं वो इस चीज को समझ लेंगे दूसरी बात आपने बहुत ही बहुत ही अच्छी बात यहाँ पे जो रखी है जो मेरे ख्याल में अगले वक्त इसको लेंगे वो ये है कि अर्बन में लाइवलीहुड्स का किस तरह से हम लोग बातचीत रखेंगे तो मेरे ख्याल में विजय आनंद जी जो आपके बाद बात करेंगे लेकिन अगर इस पे आप आप थोड़ी बात रखें तो मेरे ख्याल में सबको आप उस तस्वीर के बारे में आप आप संगठन के अंदर क्या बातचीत हो रही है उसके बारे में तो अभी सोशल मीडिया से भी पूरा देश भर के लोग ने देखा है और मैं खुद काम कर रही हूँ स्ट्रीट वेंडर्स के ऊपर जिस तरीका से आ, मैं सभी से माफी चाहती हूँ मेरा ये पॉइंट थोड़ा सा छूट गया है आ, तो ये जो बात उभर के आया खास तौर से मुस्लिम हॉकर्स के साथ में ये सबसे ज्यादा जाती हुआ है धर्म के नाम पे इसको इशू दिया गया धर्म के नाम का इशू दिया गया और, और रांची की अगर मैं बात करूं एक साधारण सी सिंपल सा उदाहरण है ये अगर रांची से अगर ये बात छोटी सी शहरों से उठ के आता है तो बड़े शहरों में क्या परिस्थिति रहा होगा तो उसमें जिस एरिया में मुस्लिम को देखा गया है उस एरिया में उनको हॉकरी करने नहीं दिया गया क्योंकि उन लोगों का जहर में है कि यही लोग हमारे कोविड नाइन्टीन को बीमारी को फैल रहे हैं ये एक झूठा झूठा एक परिस्थिति तैयार करके उनके ऊपर पुलिस के द्वारा कुछ कुछ शहरों में हर शहरों में नहीं हुआ है कुछ कुछ शहरों में ये अत्याचार चलाया गया था लेकिन इसके अभी के दौर में अभी के सिचुएशन में जब दो महीना ढाई महीना बीत गया है अभी ये परेशानी कम हुआ है क्योंकि अभी जो परिस्थिति चल रहा है कि अभी ये मामला नहीं है लेकिन शुरुआती में इसको धर्म का रूप देते हुए हमारे कुछ मुस्लिम हॉकर्स के साथ ये अत्याचार चलाया गया जब लोकल थाने और लोकल्स में बात जब चल रहा यूनियन का शक्ति से ये बात को रखा गया कुछ कुछ एरिया में और आपस में लोग तालमेल मिला के काम किया तो धीरे धीरे ये मामला अभी बंद है अभी कोई इस इशू के ऊपर चर्चा नहीं हुआ है धन्यवाद अनिता जी आई आई विल नाउ रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर विजय आनंद इज आर नेक्स्ट स्पीकर मिस्टर विजय आनंद इज एन आई एस ऑफिसर वॉज फॉर्मी ऑफ केरला एंड ही इज करंटली द चेयरमैन ऑफ द सिक्स फाइनेंस कमीशन ऑफ केरला During his long career in the administrative service, he's worked in different ministries, mainly in the field of rural development, planning, panchayati raj, etc. During his tenure as the secretary, local self-government, Mr. Vijayanand played a key role in the devolution of powers uh, and personnel to the local government institutions. He not only served as a member secretary of the Sen Committee on Democratic Decentralisation, but was but also served as a member of the second and fourth finance commission kerala as well as in the third administrative reforms panel of the state he was in charge of the people's planning process for 15 years and is seen as one of the key uh, architects of kerala's democratic decentralization initiative which took place took shape in 1990s Uh, this led to the campaign for the formulation of the ninth plan which led kerala into a lead role in the country in terms of devolution of functions functionaries and funds the kudumbasri mission was set up based on the recommendations of the task force of which he was a member as the secretary of local self government post retirement mr vijayanand is in the governing body of ngos like pradhan Banyan Pelium India and Cosport he is also the chair uh, Lori Baker Center as well as the chairman of the Center for Management Development an autonomous body under the government of Kerala uh, Mr Vijayanand welcome to this uh, discussion and uh, uh, I do hope that you would also pick up uh, from uh, amongst many things the point that professor Divan talked about in terms of decentralization and Anita Uh, thus also spoke to in terms of urban livelihoods uh, the floor is yours mr vijayan so thank you for the nice words of introduction let me start with a definition of urban this urban livelihoods is our theme and 
one thing to be realized, especially in the context of livelihoods, is urban has a lot of villages, even Mumbai, within it, fisheries, dairy, even a bit of agriculture and horticulture. So that is some relevance. And definition of livelihoods. Unfortunately, I worked for four years in the National Livelihood Mission in Delhi, and Kudabashi is a livelihood mission. We don't include health and education as part of livelihoods. Unless you include, we will not understand and we will not move ahead. We will just make temporary uh, solutions. And also, especially livelihoods of the poor, needs public services and social protection. So this is the livelihood basket which we have to be very clear about. Now coming to a new governance paradigm, which I am able to see gradually, willy nilly coming up in rural India, all over India. I'm not, I'm excluding Kerala from that. And some of the smaller municipalities, not exactly in larger municipalities and corporations, is a new governance paradigm where the panchayats are the friend line. The local governments are in the friend line in partnership with civil society organizations, volunteers, and most importantly, self-help groups, which unfortunately don't exist in most of Indian urban areas. So the governance imperative which we talked about, local needs, local development, and local democracy. This is something which we are all speaking of the Kerala model, particularly in dealing with COVID. This is the secret. The empowered local government, which, which has clear functions, has all the health institutions within the corporations, municipalities are under the control of local governments, as also Angad bodies, and the functionaries are with them, and clear functions and responsibilities with untied funds for sending them up within a framework. And this is very, very critical function, functionary matrix. That is, and then conceptually, since I was associated from day one, it is a participatory development which was aimed at. There was a lot of critique because it was a left state which went in for decentralization. So people asked in those days, are you rolling back the state? The answer was no. We are taking state to the doorsteps of the citizen. I still remember the answer given almost 24 years back. And more importantly, which or probably Kerala is the only place to do, and which should be an object lesson for others, it's the elected local government which is superior, not the commissioner or the uh, executive office. So the commissioner is only the secretary to the local government, which brings a lot of accountability on the elected council. Earlier, somebody was mentioning that councillors run away. Here, councillors can't run away. You are in the front. You can't move away from people because the power is with you, responsibility is with you, and obligations. And another unique feature, which is replicable, is replicable all over India. I think it's happening. Maybe in the near future in rural areas, is a partnership with the self help groups. It's a partnership of equals. To put it very philosophically, it is social democracy and political democracy coming to it. What Ambedkar uh, spoke about. The social democracy in the form of women's self-help groups, it could also be hawkers collective or anything equivalent, and then it is a uh, the political democracy of local people. So this was the idea of linking self-help groups with the municipalities formally. The formal linkage, a uh, one of time I cannot go into the mechanics and structure of linkages, but an interesting spin-off of this linkage is a partnership of equal. Municipality has no control over the SSG decision making, but it's a partnership. And in the last elections to local governments, I mean all local governments, including corporations to Gram Panchayat, 62% of the elected women representatives are from the SSG network, are from Kudumbash. And you can see that kind of engenders local governance. I heard engendering local development, but it is engenders local governance, which is again a huge potential. And interestingly, in Kerala, Kudumbashi originated in the urban local government. First, it was Kudumbashi in urban local governments, and then it went to rural local governments. And the important thing, it's not an SNG which is a standalone thrift and credit or a micro-enterprise organization. It's a network organization. So when you say the community development society at the municipal level or corporation level, it represents 50% of the families in the corporation. So they are a power to reckon with in democracy. So they are a voice. And because of the power, they have some kind of choice also. In Kerala, 
urban areas, but urban areas, though Kerala is largely urbanized, our municipal population is only 22% of the population. So there, we have 50,000 self-help groups, all networked into some 90 odd community development societies at the ward level. Somebody spoke of the importance of ward. There is a society called ADS, Area Development Society. So SRG, we call it neighborhood group. That's again very important. You are not a self-interest group. You are more a neighborhood group. So there is more friendliness, social capital, and that is the priority. That again is a lesson for the rest of India. And there's a lot of volunteerism. And Kudumbashree is not for self-employment and livelihoods alone. It is for human development. It is for larger capitals uh, and accessing entitlements and services. And an important thing, urban microenterprises. I had some statistics. There are more than 5,500 urban microenterprises under Kudumbashree. And surprisingly, that uh, vindicates the point made earlier, good number of them are self-employed. But they are helped properly, guided, and there is an excellent concept emerging all over India, not only in Kerala, it's called community resource person. From among the SDGs, you can have persons for help, persons doing extension, persons doing credit, and Kerala came up with an innovative idea of what is called the micro-enterprise consultant. If India could replicate micro-enterprise consultants, who are themselves poor women, and they advise the micro-enterprises of the poor. And somebody, I have had some discussions with them some time back, they said, sir, if a micro-enterprise survives for nine months, it will survive. And they said it will have a two crises in the first one and a half years. And if you can go and address the two crises, uh, probably they can come out of it. So that's the kind of support systems you have. And then the whole idea of gender empowerment. Kudumbashi has got into gender empowerment, even silently doing crime mapping and taking it to the police and all that. They are into urban agriculture, which I mentioned. And latest is construction groups. Construction is male dominated, but uh, repairing the roads, public buildings, and all that. A very important point in the context of this COVID is the credit worthiness of self help groups. Their repayment rate is about 98, 99%, more than anybody else in India. But the tragic thing, sad thing, is when the economic package came, not, a, not even a loan to SNG, only their uh, credit ceiling was increased to 20 lakhs, which means nothing. If they had been given loans, not subsidy, of let us say, an uh, amount I can't predict now, or to be repaid after three years, a huge economic stimulus, which is gender sensitive, would have emerged. We missed that opportunity. And, and the kind of expenditure they do. A very important suggestion came about urban wage employment. But I want to make a big point. At the national level and at the state levels, urban poverty is not being understood properly. And urban poverty programs, which are now in existence for more than 30 years, are extremely weak, not well conceptualized, no, no organization compared to the rural counterpart. I've done both, and you find there's practically nothing in urban barring this livelihood thing in Kerala and one or two other states. So urban poverty is ignored. It is equated to slums. It is equated to some construction, but not necessarily skilling and placing and uh, mentoring and also basic services to them. And then, now, uh, so urban employment guarantee is a state scheme, a small scheme, but it's symbolic. When you have nothing else to do, you can go and ask for a job. If the funding is only 75 crores for the current year. May not be very busy, but the poorest of the poor can go and get to avoid starvation. And in the context of COVID, local committees, preparing food. The assurance is very important. That is, the assurance came from no lesser person than the chief minister. Nobody in Kerala will go hungry, whether you are a Keralaite or not. And in Kerala, media is very active. People are people listen. So actually, nobody could go hungry, even people who are regularly hungry. So the mass, massive camps are organized. They're all organized by the partnership of local governments and Kudumbashree. And extension, enforcement of uh, the quarantine, for identifying quarantine, and all those things we have done. Now, some issues I want to highlight in terms of urban livelihood. One, I said we don't understand urban poverty. Everywhere in India, there is no concept of urban health. There is no primary health. Delhi, of course, is making an interesting innovation in Mohalla Clinic. 
but you don't find urban health, urban primary health. So that's a big area for all of you who are activists to fight for urban primary health as part of life. Then, I don't have to say, it's very well, beautifully put by Anita Das, the plight of migrants. But one thing, for the first time in my uh, life, in a sense, I remember things, reading things since the 80s and 90s, migrants have become a sensitive issue with some political traction. And there is a feeling that we have treated them wrongly. And language which I have not heard since 1990 is being used by even hardcore economists of empathy and understanding their status, dignity. So this is the big opportunity for us to work on that. Now, what succeeds in this partnership? One, clarity of responsibilities. Absolutely clear who does what. Otherwise, local governments are as bad as any public institution. So clarity of responsibilities, communication, freedom of local decision, and more importantly, expectation and demand from people. That's the partnership with SDG brings in, the demand from people, and then trust and respect. I call it soft devolution. Not that you give a lot of powers and money to local governments. You trust them as a local government. Respect them as a local government and give them space in governance. So that creates the, the user, the term from space technology, the trust, trajectory, and momentum for local governments. Technically, theoretically speaking, urban areas have more livelihood opportunities, variety of opportunities, formal, informal, manufacturing, and all that, than rural. But why are not urban livelihoods as uh, well protected in, your, in public programs like rural? One, you don't have the social capital, which SSGs can provide. You don't have the physical capital, no shelter, no room, which again, gradually, the SSGs can collectively provide, even if it be of low end. And then the natural capital, which of course is difficult in urban areas, but some greening here and there and some uh, agricultural activity brings it. But then a contribution of Kerala to the rest of India, in, much, in the livelihood dis theoretical discussion, they speak of five capitals. But I would add two more capitals. The civic capital. You are a citizen. That assertion of rights of citizen, that big network organization of SNG, can provide. And the last is political capital. I don't mean membership of political parties and becoming corporators or councillors. It means a space in decision making, power relations. So, in a sense, we can. And in urban livelihoods, not going beyond Kerala and Kudumbashi and local governments, the concept of voluntary technical code, the concept of the third sector, where volunteers from high end, private, and public will come and assist in. Nurturing livelihoods, nurturing skills. That is something which is missing in India. Even in Kerala, we are struggling. And probably one of the positive spin off of COVID would be to get this voluntary technical people uh, and others coming and working. And a point which I recently heard in a webinar made by no less a person than Dr. Prabhat, he said this is a time to localize development, not the big supply chains, supply chains from rural to urban and reverse. So start there, in a sense it's Gandhian, and move up. So that is something which we need to push. And skilling for micro-enterprises. And intermediation, that is also required. Finally, the concluding part, the remark, the new agenda. See, I am a student of English literature. I remember my professor telling me, King Lear saw more clearly after he became blind. So this extreme situation, can make us see it clearly. Public health, migrant rights, institutions of the urban poor, which are networked, democratic, decentralized local government. So you're moving from, uh, we are not even a welfare state now, from a capitalist market-driven state to a welfare state to a caring state. So I like your theme, asserting livelihoods through dignity. And that can come only through this governance paradigm shift. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vijayanand. Uh, that was a very evocative uh, understanding of uh, the ecosystem within which both decentralization and uh, conceptualization of the urban livelihoods work, you know, worked in tandem. And thank you for putting it in context because otherwise it will seem like yet another scheme, which it was not. It was actually worked together in tandem. And I think that 
it is important for us to recognize the nature of uh, how these uh, uh, reform processes spoke with each other and work with each other. Uh, thank you for building that uh, layered understanding for, for all of us. A uh, couple of points which I wanted to quickly come back to you before we uh, move on to Ritu for her next round of uh, thoughts and interventions uh, is, you know, I mean, in, in a strange way, uh, Kerala is both a receiver of guest workers as you call it uh, in Kerala, and, um, and also is going to experience a fairly significant return of labor uh, from the um, Middle East uh, countries. Uh, so unlike in many other, other states in India, it is going to have the experience of both the, both the ebbs and flows. Um, and I suppose uh, I, I was wondering whether in that context, you saw some, uh, some new processes and new openings that you might want to consider for, you know, the, uh, the last point that you were making about uh, skills amalgamating. Um, so maybe if you can give some thought to that, uh, that would be very useful for our audience as well. I think I'll make those points in my second talk. Very much. So if you were, uh, so can I now uh, move to Professor Ritu Devan again? Um, you know, you've now heard, uh, you've heard other, the two other panelists who brought in very clearly the lived experiences in two kind of systems. One, of course, uh, Anita's uh, very, very uh, evocative understanding of what has been the uh, lived experience with hawkers specifically. Uh, and uh, Mr. Vijayanand, also drawing out the larger contours of urban poverty and looking at urban livelihoods in the, in a, in a, with, as a response from a state system. Um, you had concluded your first round of uh, discussions with a few uh, policy options and some solutions. Uh, would you want to elaborate on some of those so that we can, we can you know, unpack uh, the options that you had sh shared with us? And also look at it in terms of scale, uh, at a national scale, which is what uh, you have also been working on. Um, I just, uh, there are uh, several uh, aspects one can focus on, but uh, two which I think are uh, absolutely possible and uh, doable and, and something which we ourselves can be involved in, in uh, some kind of a manner. And that is linking up the issue of um, livelihoods and living spaces. That for me is, is a very, very essential aspect. It's actually something which we have taken up quite some time back and in Bombay and there's a Supreme Court judgment you know, very much which is there. So maybe that is some one policy which we can work on. So what it does, it protects your um, urban, I'm we are talking only about urban, it protects your right to livelihood and it also protects your right to a living space. A decent living space is something which is very, very different. Because one of the major issues which we have come across in, in the past uh, few months is the fact that, uh, of course, you know, in our relief work, we were providing rations and what, and several other uh, aspects. But what came out as one of the most important aspects is not having a regular place to stay in an urban situation. Not only for uh, uh, families, but even for single people. So with rent not being, they weren't able, no money, park, wages not paid, etc., etc. Is that these people had to vacate their accommodation. You know, and, and that was something which we found very, very difficult to cope with. So they were living under flyovers, they were living, they were, there were many who we had to put up in living camps because they did not have that kind of accommodation. So for me, one of the priorities is living spaces and livelihoods. That I, I would say, and of course there are many others, but this is something which we should really uh, take up on a... Otherwise, in a way, the migrants are not going to come back. I just saw some of the comments that uh, 
they reverse migration, what COVID has done is send people back to the rural areas. Now, this was already there during the demonetization. And what it does, because if we see in the overall level, it's the only the agricultural sector which has maintained some level of growth. Only the agriculture sector. And what the agriculture sector is undergoing is a double value or a triple value from demonetization and very much so now. So instead of an urban worker migrant contributing cash to the rural, uh, to the family which is in the rural areas, that migrant worker has come back. So instead of a producer who has become I, I've heard these terms used, the Abhidhava parasite over here. You know, that he's living off a, a community and a family to which he was contributing earlier. So, they, it's going to give rise to huge contradiction in the rural areas, this contradiction between returned migrants and between the locals who have to now support the migrants. So, in a way, of course, now you have all these, uh, you know, these uh, initiatives uh, of uh, workers, of uh, employers wanting to get the workers back, sending buses. Some have even sent planes to take the workers back, but they have not paid the past wages. So, the issue of wage subsidy is also something which is very, very uh, important. And which I think there's no country in the world which has not provided a minimum uh, wage subsidy to uh, the urban uh, workers during this period, whether self-employed or hawkers or vendors or vendors. A third component I want to raise, and that is um, in terms of uh, the communal divide. Okay? And something which we found, again, my limited experience here is the fact that the way the Christian community came out and the way the Muslim community came out in supporting relief work unimaginable and unbelievable. So, you know, whether it was Ramzan period or it was Easter, people came out, they gave their masjids, they gave their churches. I mean, my college barriers gave it entire space for relief camp, for COVID, for whatever. And what I have seen is, is in fact a reduction in the communal divide because of the way these two communities have come out so strongly in support of totally, you know, unknown people, irrespective of which uh, community. And in contrast, I want to say that there are certain, you know, these clubs which are there, some international or uh, I don't want to take names, and many people say these funds, they actually ask that from this community ko dene wale ho ye ra. And what they did not want to give to was to the Kinnar community, which is the, the Hegira community, they did not want to give the sex workers. And these are two categories which were impacted uh, very badly. And I think these are the communities we need to um, focus on where urban livelihoods are uh, concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, very important points that you have flagged off for all of us. I request uh, our participants to begin to, uh, I know that there's been a series of questions that you've asked. If you would like to also begin to, to look at what the panelists have said and uh, work with that and, and raise some uh, comments as well, please do that. It will be very interesting for, to hear your voices as well. Many of you are senior activists and uh, people who have been in the public discourse for a long time. So welcome uh, to uh, contribute to this discussion after this round is over. Uh, Anita ji, aap ke paas mein aa raho abhi. Uh, do teen sawal hain jo, uh, jo main dek raho yaha pe chat mein bhi aur lekin aap, aap agar aap kuch aur baato ko rak, rakna chaate hain to uske bhaar mein bhi baat kije ga. Uh, ek to bad, bahut badi mudda jo aapne last time, uh, last jo uh, baat rakhi thi wo livelihoods ke baare mein ke sanpark mein aapne bataya tha to us pe aapko agar koi ap matlab hawkers federation ke baare ke paas koi soch agar hai to fir us soch ko zara batayenge to fir sab ke liye wo better hoga dusri baat ye ki 
हमारे साथियों ने यहाँ पे पूछा है कि आपको लोन की व्यवस्था मिली है इस दौरान और अगर मिली है तो फिर आप की जानकारी में किस तरह की लोन की व्यवस्था हुई है सो ये दो तीन बातें जो है मुझे लगता है कि अगर आप उस पर बातचीत करें तो वो हमारे लिए बेहतर हो मैं ये पहले में लोन का बारे में जो आपका सवाल है उसको पहले क्लियर करती हूँ लोन के बारे में जो है हम लोग लगातार गवर्नमेंट से जब बात बात कर रहे थे तो हम लोगों ने ये बात कहा था कि हमारे जो सीट वेंडर्स हैं उनको अभी मजबूत करना है इस समय पे तो क्योंकि उनका जो घर में रखा हुआ क्योंकि दुकान पूरा बंद है और इस लॉकडाउन के पीरियड में वो उनका जो पूंजी है वो तोड़ के खत्म कर दे रहे हैं और जब हॉकर कभी भी वो अपना पूंजी को खत्म नहीं करते हैं और बच्चे का मुंह में खाना देने के लिए उनका पूंजी ढाई महीना हो गया दुकान बंद है तो उनका पूंजी खत्म हो गया तो सरकार को जब हम लोगों ने बोला कि उनके खाते में कम से कम तीन हजार से पांच हजार रुपया देना चाहिए इस समय पे छह महीना के लिए लेकिन सरकार उस बात को नकारते हुए उन्होंने बोला हम लोन का प्रावधान करते हैं लेकिन लोन का प्रावधान लोन का जो प्रावधान था वो तो 2014 के कानून के बाद ऑलरेडी हमारे कानून में ही तैयार था कि लोन दे सकते हैं लेकिन नया क्या दिया सब्सिडी जब हम लोगों ने मांगा कि सरकार सब्सिडी दे लेकिन उसमें भी सरकार ने नकारते हुए उन्होंने एक ही बात कहा कि लोन देना है वो भी कितने टेन थाउजेंड दस हजार लेकिन दस हजार की जो दस हजार की जो अमाउंट की जो संख्या है वो दस बोरा आलू का भी दाम नहीं है मतलब अगर एक गारमेंट कपड़ा बेचने वाले आ, कपड़ा बेचने वाले अगर हमारे हॉकर है साथी वो उनको दस हजार रूपया में क्या पूंजी होगा उनका एक सौ सलवर कमीज का दाम आता है पच्चीस हजार रूपया तो मैं सबसे कम अमाउंट का संख्या बोल रही हूँ तो आज दस बोरा आलू भी दाम नहीं होगा इधर एक सौ सलवर कमीज जो वो बेचेंगे पूंजी लगा के वो भी नहीं होगा लेकिन आज ये सरकार ने किया दस हजार रुपया लोन दे रहे हैं वो भी सेवन परसेंट ब्याज में सर साल में लेकिन आ, हम लोगों की ये बात करते हुए लेकिन सरकार को अभी चाहिए था कोऑपरेटिव करके हम लोग मांग कर रहे हैं हमारे हमारा जो छोटा उद्योग है जो उनके लिए कोऑपरेटिव करके इनके अर्थव्यवस्था और इनको इकोनॉमिकली को और मजबूत करने के लिए इसका जो काम जा रहे हैं और नया हॉकर जो अभी बढ़ रहे हैं और उनको भी मजबूत करना है हमें तो इसी परिस्थिति में कोऑपरेटिव करके हमको उनको मजबूत करने का ये हमारी एक मांग है और 100 दिन का काम का भी जो हम लोग मेरा बातों में मैंने कहा था लास्ट ये रूरल में ये ये गांव में से शहर में भी ये चीज की जरूरत है हमारे जो 100 दिन का काम है ये इससे भी कुछ हमारे साथी को बहुत मजबूती होगा जो बाहर से आ रहे हैं जो जो और दोबारा लौट के नहीं जाएंगे बाहर ये सोच रहे हैं जो भयंकर परिस्थिति से वो गुजरा देखा डेड बॉडी के साथ वो वापस आए उनके लिए कोई साधन नहीं है आज जो परिस्थिति महिलाओं के साथ उतरा वो तो सोच रहे हैं दस बार के हम बाहर जाने के लिए दस बार सोच रहे हैं उनका क्या होगा तो उन सभी लोगों को मजबूत करने के लिए एक सौ दिन का काम आरबान में जरूरत है और कॉपरेटिव करके उनका पूरा छोटा बिजनेस उद्योग करके ये सरकार को सोचना चाहिए ये हमारा डिमांड है हम लोगों ने सरकार के पास रखे इस डिमांड धन्यवाद अनिता जी मैं आपके पास वापस आऊंगा हमारे जो जो वेबिनार में हैं काफी सारे आपके लिए भी प्रश्न हैं तो मैं उसको बताते जाऊंगा अगले राउंड में अब मैं विजयानंद जी के पास जा रहा हूं अभी मिस्टर विजयानंद माय क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द प्रीवियस राउंड रिमेंस फॉर यू टू टू कंसीडर इन एडिशन टू दैट देयर बीन कपल ऑफ अदर पॉइंट्स व्हिच हैव आल्सो कम अप क्विकली व्हिच आई थॉट दैट इफ यू मे वांट टू आल्सो address that in your round in this round uh, one has been a reference to the ayangali uh, uh, urban uh, sort of uh, urban uh, employment process maybe if you may want to look at that 
The other point is also the nature of uh, employment that in urban areas are being offered in the urban employment guarantee schemes. If you may want to speak to that as well. I'm sure that you have other points to make, but uh, just adding a couple of small things to your, to what you may have already considered speaking on. So some of the questions which I saw in the chat box also I'll try to quickly respond to. Now question of returned migrants. By some, we don't have accurate statistics. It's been calculated that about 25 lakh migrants from the rest of India are in Kerala. And 20 lakh, 25 lakh Malayalis have, Keralites have migrated mostly to the, uh, the Gulf region. Of course, the big question is, will the Gulf economy revive as quickly as people anticipate? The present mode is, yes, it's optimism. And very few people are thinking of settling back in Kerala, uh, though they are in great admiration of the health and other facilities. A good number of them want to go back. And another interesting thing, a large number of migrants who have left Kerala. My guess is almost all of them will come back because Kerala has the culture, because the migrants of Kerala in the Gulf don't enjoy a very luxurious life. It's much more difficult than somebody else's life in Kerala. And they're all doing it to earn some money. So their appreciation of a migrants uh, in a cultural sense, in a social sense, is very deep. So they are well treated and their wage is around 700 to 800 rupees per an unskilled worker. So the economy being what it is in the rest of India, and since they are reasonably well taken care of, I wouldn't say perfectly, then they are likely to come back. But then something which is emerging more as a preposition rather than as a concrete thing, Kerala seems to have got a huge uh, kind of, I would not use the word publicity, is not a good word, recognition all over the world for the quality of healthcare services. And Kerala's largest export is nurses. And I'm sure Europe will take any number of people from Kerala, particularly they, are, they need a lot of caregivers. And so that way, new dimensions of employment are likely to open. Second question is regarding the uh -huh, employment guarantee scheme. You know, as I told you, it's more symbolic. The allocation is only 75 crores. Actually, you may require about 200, 300 crores. But they are properly linked it to local agriculture, production of vegetables. The Kudumbashree women only execute the works and it is gender sensitive. Most of the workers, almost 95% are women. In that sense, it is making some uh, leeway. And now they added, anybody who sells 10 liters of milk from her own cow or cows to the society will be deemed to be one person day for getting a daily wage. So that's a handsome way of supporting the local economic development. I personally feel in urban areas, Employment guarantee should also look at services, care services, looking after the elderly and things of that kind. Then the question of what exactly the SEGIs can do in economic development and urban local government uh, can do in development. That is, economic development is a difficult thing. I think Kerala, they have done, uh, local governments have done well to help poverty, but not larger economic development of the jobs which Kerala's would prefer. But in many places, not the big urbanized uh, metro kind of things, urban agriculture, group farming for the landless, some kind of a FPO. FPO is a very difficult thing. I've studied FPOs in great detail. It's very difficult. But the organization of the poor can negotiate access to all services which are there. The demand factor for public services, plus the community resource persons uh, helping them achieve all this. Regarding participation, area sabhas are slightly vague like the Gram sabhas. But when you have a network organization of women representing 50% of the population, then they are a force to reckon with. And Kudumbashi has an area development society. The last question is, in spite of Kerala model, there is still a lot of social exclusion. I would say Social exclusion of the kind you find in the rest of India is not very common. But economic and development exclusion seems to be there in respect of the scheduled tribes. It's, a, it's one of the shame thing for Kerala. Somehow the Kerala's tribes who constitute some 1.4% of the population have not reached anywhere close to the Kerala model. Same thing for traditional fisher port. It's what you call it more a economic and development exclusion rather than uh, social exclusion. For Dalits also, all inclusion is there, 
barring higher economic development, not the lower end economic development, slightly higher economic development, jobs in the IT sector, jobs in tourism, jobs in the uh, West, skill jobs, probably they are wanted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vijayanand. Uh, now, I think what I'll do is to also take uh, the questions that have come to all of us, uh, to the panelists. Uh, Mr. Vijayanand himself has uh, looked at the chat box and responded to few, but I'm sure that there will be a few more questions that will also come up as we go along. Um, so please keep your questions coming uh, so that we can make the best use of the, uh, the panel that we have, which is a, a very enlightening panel. So uh, a few questions, which uh, maybe I'll start with Professor Ritu Diwan. Uh, you, you may have noticed some of these questions, but let me read it out for you. Uh, one of them is from Raju Bise. Uh, his question is, people living in urban slum contribute to industries, businesses, cities themselves. How to include and position them in the urban economy? Can we term these bastis as city service hubs? If yes, then what would it mean for town planning and what kind of reforms are required for that? Uh, there is a question again from Himanshu Damle. He said, uh, well, it's a comment and there's also a question hidden in it. He says, I honestly don't know how much of the whole informal economy sector the freelancers are part of, unlike in Germany and other European nations, where there's a provision by the state to provide minimum wage for work lost. Do you think it's possible in India that, uh, that after considering uh, the uh, government, will government consider that? The caveat being, I do not know the freelance is a complex matter to be looked into. Uh, Pawan Preet Kaur, question is about labor. What about labor in the entertainment industries? They are also badly hit with workforce being freelancers. How do we mull over the question of film labor, especially the migrants? Um, there's a question which I think Mr. Um, Vijayanand did uh, refer to uh, from Suhas uh, Kolkekar, uh, how, many, how can we push the demand for urban health posts to be reactivated in the context of the pandemic on the lines of the Delhi Mohalla clinics? So maybe I think we can do a bit of uh, some of these questions and try and link it up with also the uh, original points that you were making uh, to see whether there's, a, there's something that we can look at in terms of a broader narrative for urban livelihoods. Uh, several questions and uh, all very important and uh, also one or two uh, responses, one or two responses, I just want to say one or two things on the, one thing on the Kerala model. Okay, Kerala is the only state in India which has a planning board. There is no state in India or union territory in India where the planning board exists. So policies are ad hoc at the whim, there, there's no vision at all of where you want to go, whether it's at the short term or the medium term or in the long term. So I think that is something as an economic policy, it, 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 I would say that every state should go back to their uh, planning uh, board uh, days. Of course, you see what happened in the center, which is uh, very uh, different. There are uh, many issues and one or two other additional points which I would uh, like to uh, say. One is the uh, uh, point, of course, I mean that uh, what we suggested is in a way a takeoff or an expansion of the context of linking up living spaces and workspaces, including services, not only in terms of employment and wage employment, but self-employment and services, manufacturing, etc., etc. And therefore, we have this very broad debate which is going on, and uh, that's among you know a few architect friends and urban planners and some of us as uh, development uh, economists. That is not to reimagine a city. Okay, reimagining of city in the wake of what is happening and in the wake of the issue of exclusion of those who actually make the city. So this comes, uh, I think there's a lot of debate uh, on this which is ongoing and uh, whether it's the issue of affordable housing or linking up these spaces, linking up, you know, making workers cooperative, workers collective, 
this is something which we really need to take into account. The architecture and the planning of the city, that is something which is extremely uh, important. What we term now is reimagining the city. There is uh, also a question, and I think this uh, comes up uh, very often, the issue of Narega. That is now, uh, that is rural. I've been seeing some of the issues uh, as the question which have been posed here. But yes, we need strengthening of the Narega. And also we need strengthening of, which has already been pointed out by Professor Vidyanan, that the urban poverty programs or the urban employment programs are virtually non -made. And we, in Maharashtra, there's not even, I think, not even 90% of the allocation has been used of the little pathetic, you know, few hundred crores which has been used. Now, what Narega really was, and that's the struggle that we had, that it recognizes and inserts that it is a con right, it's a constitutional right to get work. Okay. If, it, if Narega says it's a, it represents the constitutional right to work of every individual in the rural area, it is as much applicable to the country. The, the right to work component it cannot be only for one sector and not to the urban and not to the other sector. Of course, this includes services and, and the, every single uh, component, able body, you know, where they want to take it from 15 years to 59 years or uh, 18 years to 59 years, it, it's a different kind of a debate in the context of child labor, which also, by the way, we have seen increasing during the uh, time of uh, COVID and also during the time of uh, uh, demonetization. And to a lesser extent than what is taking place uh, today. And to say that, you know, the relief package, I, I think that a separate uh, discussion because it is the greatest slate of hand, financial slate of hand that one has seen. Because what it does is that it dumps a whole lot of allocations under the budget, puts it as part of the relief, takes up some schemes which were announced very differently quite some time back put them as part of the uh, so-called relief and what it does is convert assistance into loans. Now this issue of loans is something which is I think the most unethical, absolutely the most unethical con concept of the uh, relief uh, package. And to say that there is not enough funds, you know I'm a budget analyst also and it's unbelievable the kind of money this is available. Forget about what has been given to NPAs or tax deductions or tax holidays which are being given. That is a totally different kind of a situation. Uh, one is 60,000 crores, 60,000 crores on the central vista. Okay, the creation of a new parliament house with a tunnel, etc. etc. We filed a petition in Delhi High Court, we can told go to the Supreme Court, it's on today or tomorrow, hopefully. So that there is money. There's money for plane. There's money day before yesterday for a digital rally, which cost seventy-two thousand crores. So, you know, it, there is there is more than enough money which is available. The point is, do you want to give it or not, or what purpose you want to use those resources for relief of which kind of people and for which uh, purpose? Another aspect which has not come up, but which many of us as financial economists also object to, this. You know, 1500 rupees given to the women of the household. That is something which was announced some time back. And that 1500 rupees is given as 500 rupees per month, which is the most administratively inefficient component. See, pathetic 500 is really nothing. And I'm not even going to talk about what it can get or what it cannot get, etc. But to distribute. That amount of money three times is the kind of effort which is needed, whether it's administrative or bureaucratic or financial, or the effort of these women to spend 200 rupees to travel to the headquarters to get that 500 rupees. If it could have been given at one go. So there's also the efficiency of resource allocation or resource distribution which has to be taken into account. There are uh, two uh, more. Um, Question. I think one somebody asked me about artificial intelligence. I think some students from this has put up that uh, question. I I don't know what artificial intelligence 
implies in a context where where forty eight percent of the women are illiterate, where thirty percent, thirty five percent of the men are illiterate, where you cannot afford a mobile phone to run it. I mean that was a major issue we came with the migrant uh, workforce concern. Or you do not have this online classes which are taking place. I think more than half the students in the country who are registered are out of any kind of learning because of this online. So if you talk of digitalization in the context of illiteracy, you talk of artificial intelligence, I am not able to link. Maybe that aspect can be explained a bit more. Uh, film labor I, is like all labor, is, is uh, something which has to be taken into account. And I must say that at least in Bombay, in, in the Bombay film industry, I don't know about the other film industry, there are three individuals who have taken a huge amount of, spent a huge amount of money in supporting every single film worker. There is 10,500 given to every film worker by one actor. There is the issue of dry rations being given every week to every single film person, whether registered or unregistered. I'm talking of people who are technicians and at the lower level in terms of what we call spot boys, etc. Et Other areas I'm really not uh, familiar with. But there's a lot of organizing and reorganizing between media where that is concerned. The issue of health, there is one uh, model, one, um, it's not a model, it's a policy and it's a very visionary kind of a policy that yes, you need many, many more health workers. So of course you have your doctors and your nurses and whether their services need to be, you know, nationalized in terms of the private hospitals is a different debate. But there's also this, uh, the vision of having what are called food doctors. If you're barefoot doctors, that is something which we've been hearing about, talking about, implemented in some places in uh, in different parts of the country, but not taken uh, seriously. We want to look after not only health, but also the issue of education. And I'm not talking of ASHA workers, okay? that's a totally different uh, uh, category. The last aspect which I want to focus on is I think uh, that's another question that somebody asked, is the question of uh, civil society. And, uh, you know, there was a huge amount of resentment amongst the many NGOs who are part of uh, the organizing of this um, uh, webinar and several others. And the resentment and rage which we had over the last few years, how anything that we do is reduced. Our wings are flipped in terms of resources, in terms of rules, in terms of procedures, etc. So when Niti Ayo came up and said, NGOs, please help us. I mean, it, it was, I think, a, there can be no greater illustration of the collapse of, of the center than there is in terms of turning to NGOs. We, of course, cannot fill and do what the state is doing, what the state has the potential of doing. But certainly, I think NGOs are, and, and when I say NGOs, I'm talking of unions, I'm talking of collectives, I'm talking of cooperatives, I'm not talking only. And this term civil society is something which I have never understood. I mean, it's as if there is something which is uncivil. Okay, so we are talking of those who are really concerned for for the people. So people's society, or whatever term we see, they want to use. I think we need, really need to get our act together to come together more collectively and on a long term with a long-term vision of what we intend doing and how do we intend doing and not remain scattered as we are uh, anymore. So therefore having these 20 different organizations organizing these webinars is, is I think a huge step uh, for Thank you. I hope there's nothing I've left out. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, you did a fairly comprehensive job of uh, taking on as many questions as possible. I'm sure that there will be a few more for you. Uh, you, have, you always do provoke questions, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, let me, uh, Anita ji, aapke paas mai aarao, yahan pe uh, kuch to sawalat the aapke, aapne jo bataya tha. Lekin, mera ek sawal jo tha, jo aap, uh, agar uspe 
थोड़ा गौर करेंगी तो अच्छा होगा हम सबके लिए वो ये था कि अगर आज की तारीख में सरकार सिविल सोसाइटी आप जैसे जो यूनियंस जो हैं इनके साथ अगर हम लोगों को आगे के लिए कुछ काम काम का स्ट्रेटजी बनाना है तो उसके बारे में आपका सोच क्या है क्योंकि आप तो अभी जानते हैं कि किस तरह से आगे की मतलब एक्सपीरियंस तो आपने देखा होगा लेकिन आगे की सोच आप क्या रखते हैं अभी जो परिस्थिति है ये जो हॉकर का जो स्थान दे रहे हैं हॉकरी जो कर रहे हैं उसका अभी बिजनेस खत्म हो गया और अभी ऑफिस भी अभी घर से ही चलेगा ऑनलाइन पे तो अभी एक प्लान मतलब हम लोग सोच रहे हैं नेशनल हॉकर्स फेडरेशन के ये ये बिजनेस ये हॉकर्स की बिजनेस कैसे चालू रखे और कैसे इस प्रक्रिया को अभी तक लेके जाए क्योंकि इस परिस्थिति बहुत भयंकर है तो हम लोगों ने ये प्लान किया हॉकर्स का जो बाजार है हॉकर्स बाजार डॉट कॉम मतलब हॉकर्स ऑनलाइन पे ये बिजनेस करेंगे कोऑपरेटिव करके हॉकर्स की जो बिक्री है इसको एक कोऑपरेटिव के जैसा करके किसानों की एक कोऑपरेटिव करके हॉकर्स की एक कोऑपरेटिव करके सबको हम लोग जो छोटा उद्योगकारी है जो आ, जो छोटा छोटा सामान बेचते हैं उन जो सामान लेके आते हैं सबको मिला के जो कोऑपरेटिव करके हम लोग ये ये ऑनलाइन पे डिलीवरी करेंगे अगर ये ये परिस्थिति संभव होगा तो बहुत ही अच्छा ये पहल होगा पूरा देश के लिए आ, ये हमारे ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को लगता है लाइवलीहुड के लिए भी ये बहुत बड़ा काम होगा हॉकर्स बाजार डॉट कॉम हेलो हाँ धन्यवाद अनिता जी आ, मैं आपके पास वापस आऊंगा जो अगर आपके लास्ट कुछ कमेंट्स हैं तो फिर मैं लूंगा भी विजयानंद जी के बाद रितु हाँ। के बाद जब वो अपने कंक्लूडिंग कमेंट्स बताएंगे तो उसके बाद मैं आप, आपके पास भी आऊंगा तो सोच अगर कुछ है तो फिर उस पर उस वक्त आप कंक्लूड कर लीजिएगा मिस्टर विजयानंद आई मीन यू बिन यू बिन नोटिसिंग ऑल्सो द क्वेश्चन विच है डायरेक्टेड एट यू Uh, I would certainly invite your attention to a rather provocative one about you being the chief secretary of yes. Northern State. If I mention, so maybe my time to consider that. Yeah. First question I would answer is, how does the social democracy model of Kerala work? As I said, two three percent of the people are still excluded from the social democracy model. But one, it works through organisation. You take a typical Keralaite. he or she would be member of four or five organizations and or an attitude of government not now right from the earlier historic days of some kind of tolerance meeting demands half way so that is the governance attitude people's organization then relationships relationships with the government and that becomes closer when you have a local government system and an accountable council uh, so that is the way but a very important point from sir ritu had mentioned India has forgotten planning, and I don't find anybody mourning the loss of planning. Planning didn't mean great Soviet kind of planning; it was only thinking through resource allocation and having some consultations and coming out to the people saying that this is the logic of our resource allocation that has been killed. And fortunately, Kerala is the only place in the country, and it is not the only opposition state which has a planning board and a 13 five-year plan. And as part of the plan. Yes, yes, C S P for the scheduled cast and a tribal sub plan, and about 11 percent of the fund is given untied for their needs, which is one way of social inclusion. The next question is S S G and big economic development. I can only give you a philosophical answer. Uh, somebody, a very bright person, told me there would not have been Amul but for a combination of Trivandas and Vargis Kuriyar. So we are waiting for that combination to come in the S S G. it has a huge potential for an amul like production by the sgs but management by professional it's, it's a very fine model but i have not seen any evidence though in kerala we tried two three times and it was not very successful talking of urban health i think that's a major area where we all need to touch it nobody is going to ignore urban primary health not even in us so i think there will be a, a demand for that political traction for that and some concern for that because that's 
been highlighted. One way of doing it is through a local government and a, some kind of a Mughala system and a point which is mentioned are the barefoot doctors from the SNGs. Basically extension, health awareness and maybe simple kind of measurement of diabetes and pressure and all that. So it could be done. But something which I require, not for the urban areas, is that India should make it compulsory for every person before getting a formal right to practice in India to work two years in any area of India according to some norm and being paid the salary of a doctor, not free. This is something which US does for soldiers. I think it's easily doable in India. Without that, we are not going to get doctors in slums or in remote areas. Now, somebody asked a question about ecological living. I'm told pandemics make us think. And now there is some kind of green shoots on nature is good, carbon is less, air is cleaner, uh, water is clearer, those kind of things. So these impressions can be utilized to make some understanding of ecology while we plan a post-COVID uh, uh, life. UBI. I'm personally against a big UBI covering everybody, like they did in Spain recently. It could be certain that word is that kind of a paradox, targeted UBI at the widows, persons with disabilities, mental disabilities, people above 70. So there could be, we can get a lot of uh, hard data. Of course, some people will still get excluded. That kind of UBI may be much more worth doing and much more effective. And the question about one ration, one card. I, I would support it because portability of entitlements has been a long-standing demand. And there will all be an announcements. So if you try this, there are issues. For example, Kerala has 25 lakh migrants. And it totally depends on quota from the FCI. And this is not small quota. 25 lakh is 10% of the population. So you need to increase the quota. It's not just he, can, he or she can buy. But it's doable. Then Maju's fear that surveillance. Surveillance is very much there. We need a larger discussion on how to do surveillance. With your own mobile, even if it is not there, you can be surveilled so, for everything. So I think surveillance is a concern. The last question is not a provocative question. The kind of question which I had anticipated when I attended the UPSC interview 40 years back, 39 years back. What did you do if you are the CS? But now I can give a more realistic answer, saying that I'm not the whole development and growth and all that, but just looking at is there is something called as is where is panchayatra. Every state is given some kind of power, even even it be just supervised under bodies. So you convert that power into a reality, what has been given politically in the local, in the context. And then this partnership with the SHS, which is also doable. Fortunately, in the states you have suggested, SHS are very strong, though panchayats are extremely weak. And this will give them a mutual kind of a dynamic strength of uh, some synergy. And that I would call a virtuous circle. You are trusted with some basic responsibility. Your performance is good. Probably people would look at you better. That virtuous circle and what I call soft evolution could happen. That would be my strategy if you were a CSE Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Visyanand. And uh, thank you for putting it in perspective as well. I, would, I know that there are questions which are uh, very, uh, very much out there. Uh, the panelists have tried very hard to make sure that they, have, they try and respond to as many of the questions. We are in the last three minutes of the uh, program, so the webinar. So I suppose maybe we should not uh, extend the uh, process by having more questions uh, to the panelists. But uh, if I may, if I have the uh, permission of the panelists, maybe I, sh I should just begin to close and conclude uh, if you... If you believe that there is some more closing comments to be made, Professor Ritu, is there anything that you would like to do? I'd just like to say one thing. There was a question about artificial intelligence and then that person has clarified in relation to data and data which is available, can it be used, etc. But, uh, you know, the data for the last few years has been totally unreliable. Okay, the migrant data which was released about four days ago, the number of migrants it talks about is equal to the number of migrants at the, in the national level is actually equal to the number of migrants in Maharashtra alone. So this, um, I think the data in the last few years is uh, just not acceptable in terms of employment, in terms of GDP, in terms of 
it, you know, I call data the new urban nuptial. Okay, it's to be jailed. It is not to be given bail. It's not to be distributed. It's not to be circulated, and it's not to be released. So, uh, to use the preliminary data, macro data of what is being circulated in the last few years is it is not a good way. In fact, there's some alternate which we ourselves that we have to create, and which we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anita ji. अगर आप आपके कुछ कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स रखना चाहते हैं तो अभी इस समय पे आज ये कोविड नाइन्टीन के समय पे जो परिस्थितियां आ रहे हैं जिन लोगों की जो नौकरी जा रहे हैं मजदूर किसान अनऑर्गेनाइज सेक्टर की तमाम के साथ मिलके आज एक साथ मिलके हम लोगों को आज रोड पे उतरना पड़ेगा और हमारी जो मांग है इसी इसी को मजबूती के साथ हमारी मांगों को आगे करके पूरा शहरी मजदूर शहरी गरीब तमाम लोगों को एक मंच के साथ आके हमारी बात को रखना पड़ेगा यही मौके पे हम लोगों को इकट्ठा होना है तमाम वर्ग के लोगों के साथ मिलकर धन्यवाद विजयानंद एनी कंक्लूडिंग जस्ट टू रीस्टेट दिग एजेंडा primary health all of you whether you are involved in a not should take it up that is the sustenance and foundation of livelihoods second is migrant rights even if people don't believe in their intrinsic human rights at least is their instrumental value to the economy which has now been written about so migrant rights otherwise they'll all be subsumed into the de deadly code which will deny what little they had they have now the third and most important is democratic local governance a paradigm involving csos sgs and local governments from a welfare state to a caring state thank you thank you i i just want to make one statement that in no. fact uh, uh, what is on now is something we are struggling to go back into the concept of development it just been growth 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 without taking people into account so putting people back in the center of every policy every resource every action think that is the most uh, big thank you all right thank you so uh, it is a, it was a brilliant uh, exposition around the uh, discussion around the urban livelihoods and through that looking at the larger political context as well uh, for me uh, what's emerging clearly is that the ideology that was dominant for the last 30 40 years is beginning to decay what will replace it i guess nobody knows for sure um, it's not hard to imagine that this crisis might send down send us down even a darker path uh, as we see in uh, in some states in the context of the labor law what they call relaxation um, rulers might use this to seize more power restrict their population our populations freedom and stoke the flames of racism and hatred all that we have also seen in the in the conversation today but it also can be different i guess uh thanks to the hard work of countless activists academics networkers and agitators uh we can also imagine another way and maybe this this series of webinars about reimagination is really about that as well uh, so this pandemic could send us down a path of new values uh the points that uh, some of you were making as well Uh, if there was one dogma that defined in my mind uh, new liberalism that was that most people are ourselves and it's from that cynical view of human nature that all the rest flow privatization the growing inequalities and the erosion of public sphere i think now a space is opened up for a different and more realistic view of human nature that human kind can evolve to cooperate a word that all the three panelists have been using uh, throughout the last two hours and it's from that conviction that all the rest can follow a government based on trust a tax system which is rooted in solidarity and a sustained and sustainable investments needed to secure our future and all this just in time to be prepared for the biggest test of our century not the pandemic in slow motion but the climate change issue which is really emerging and and hitting us very soon i mean we uh, anita das talked about the amfan in addition to 
what else was happening. Uh, nobody knows where this crisis will lead us to, but compared to the last time, I think the conversations have begun and maybe we are a little better prepared to take this on for the future. With that hope, uh, I think that I would like to conclude this uh, webinar and I hope that uh, for all of us who have been part of this process, it's been very useful. Thank you very much and I hand it back to Senfa and to you all. Uh, thank you very much, Katie and the panelists for this uh, wonderful discussion and uh, wonderful engagement with all of us. Uh, the next in the section of uh, webinars will be held uh, in on Friday, which would be on uh, urban employment and the role uh, on employment guarantee and the role of the state. So kindly do join us uh, in the in the next webinar too. This webinar has also been uh, possible with the help of you are conceptualizing the same and ideating uh, with us. And thank you, you are also in terms of. Uh, helping us putting together uh, this webinar. Thank, thank you. See you in the next webinar on Friday, the coming Friday. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.